on World News Tonight. Soaring temperatures. Plumes of smoke fill the air around a New Delhi landfill due to climate change. Fighting continues. Russian forces bat on to take control of eastern Ukraine cities. Tonight, find out the global consequences. Global growth. World Bank warns of stagflation and lowest forecast this year for growth. And Canada shines. Niagara Falls bathed in purple and the night skies illuminate. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we are starting off tonight's broadcast with neighboring India. Students living near a dump yard in India's New Delhi have no choice but to attend classes next to the burning landfill, although it is causing breathing problems, stomach issues and a burning sensation in their eyes. Plumes of smoke fill the air around this New Delhi landfill. It's prone to fires during the summer months and is even polluting the area's groundwater. But right next door, students are attending school. With soaring temperatures and heat waves, firefighters have struggled with persistent blazes here. This most recent fire put classes on hiatus. But teachers say they have no choice but to bring students back. Residents say the landfill has become a source for disease, but the garbage keeps piling up. New Delhi, the world's most polluted capital, lacks a proper waste disposal system. Every day, thousands of tons of waste arrive at landfills just like this one. President Zelensky made it clear Ukrainian forces are not giving up their positions. With shipping cut off, Western countries are blaming Moscow for the global food crisis. Intense fighting continues with Russian forces seeking to gain control of the eastern Ukrainian city of Severodonetsk. According to the armed forces of Ukraine on Tuesday, Russia is shelling the city using artillery, planes and helicopters. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says the intensity of fighting there and Lyshyshenk nearby has made them both dead cities. But added, Ukrainian forces are not giving up. We have a difficult situation in the east. You know the situation in Severodonetsk. We are maintaining the situation. They outnumber us. They are more powerful. But nevertheless, I think we have every chance. However, heavy fighting in the nearby Donbas region continues, and Russian forces are also approaching the north, resuming attacks on the key city of Slovyansk. Meanwhile, Western countries have spoken out about the dramatic consequences of Russia's war spilling over across the globe. During a UN Security Council meeting on Monday, European Council President Charles Michel addressed the 15-member body, saying that Russia is solely responsible for the food crisis. He also cited reports of sexual violence. We hear reports of Russian forces wielding sexual violence as a weapon of war. Sexual violence is a war crime, a crime against humanity, a tactic of torture terror and repression, shameful acts in a shameful war. And this must be exposed to the light of day and prosecuted without impunity. Russia's UN Ambassador Vasily Nebensia said he categorically refutes any accusations against sexual violence from Russian troops. The World Bank has slashed its growth forecast for 2022 and also warned of stagflation risk reminiscent of the 1970s. The bank's latest global economic prospects report warns of a potentially harmful consequences for middle and low income economies alike. The World Bank on Tuesday slashed its global growth forecast by nearly a third for 2022, warning that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has compounded the damage from the COVID-19 pandemic raising the risk of global stagflation. In its Global Economic Prospects report, the World Bank said the war in Ukraine has magnified the slowdown in the global economy, which could soon be facing the painful combination of feeble growth and rising prices known as stagflation, last seen in the 1970s. 
The World Bank said global growth could fall to 2.1% in 2022 and 1.5% 1 in 2023, driving per capita growth close to zero if downside risks materialized. And when you have growth rate at the global level around 1.5%, that means you are in a very serious, severe downturn. Ian Coe's director of World Bank's Prospects Group, warns global economic weakness could lead to geopolitical risks. We still see supply disruptions. Because of the war, those supply disruptions, of course, uh, magnify. There is risk associated with even larger uh, food crisis down the road. And uh, when you have these types of challenges, uh, the risk of social tensions, of course, increases. World Bank President David Malpass said subdued growth will likely persist throughout the decade, forecasting that between 2021 and 2024, the pace of global growth could slow by 2.7 percentage points, more than twice the deceleration seen between 1976 and 1979. The report noted that interest rate increases required to control inflation at the end of the 1970s were so steep that they touched off a global recession in 1982 and a string of financial crises in emerging market and developing economies. But while there are similarities to conditions back then, economists point out there are also important differences, including the strength of the U.S. dollar and generally strong balance sheets at major financial institutions. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen told senators that she expected inflation to remain high and the Biden administration would likely increase to 4.7 percent inflation forecast for this year in its budget proposal. Senator, we're seeing high inflation in almost all developed countries around the world. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen was in the hot seat Tuesday. In opening remarks to the Senate Finance Committee, Yellen said the U.S. faces what she called unacceptable levels of inflation, but said much of it was caused by residual snarls in the global supply chain and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Yellen has come under fire from Republicans after admitting she was wrong last year in forecasting that inflation would be transitory and quickly subside. Here's Republican John Thune of South Dakota. But do you still view inflation, which remains near a 40-year high, as transitory, uh, or do you expect an extended period of raised inflation? Well, when I said that inflation would be transitory, what I was not anticipating was a scenario in which we would end up contending with multiple variants of COVID that would be scrambling our economy and global supply chains. And I was not envisioning um, impacts on food and energy prices we have seen from Russia's invasion. So um, I, do I do expect inflation to remain high, although I very much hope that it will be coming down now. Republicans have blamed the Biden administration's policies, particularly the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan passed in 2021, for fueling the fastest inflation in almost 40 years. And do you think that it is at all attributable to the overheated economy that was accelerated by last year's $1.9 trillion partisan spending bill? Look, when President Biden took office, um, the United States faced a, a really horrendous problem in that um, it was projected that unemployment would stay extremely high for many years. Yellen said the ARP fueled a robust recovery and argued that the U.S. economy was now moving from recovery to stable growth and was in a good position to tamp down rising prices. She also urged lawmakers to act on the White House's proposals for clean energy and prescription drugs to bring down costs for consumers. Still in the U.S., in the Biden administration's latest push to stem the Central American migrant crisis, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris said that her investment call to action has secured $3.2 billion in corporate pledges and aimed to addressing some of the economic factors that are driving the migration. $3.2 billion. That's how much companies are pledging to help the migrant crisis in Central America. It's a major part of a U.S. push who's growing some Vice President Kamala Harris announced on Tuesday. 
Names like Visa and Gap are now on board to address some of the economic factors fueling the crisis. And the new numbers lend weight to the agenda at this week's Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles. When we provide economic opportunity for people in Central America, we address an important driver of migration. Harris launched the initiative in the middle of last year, and the new commitments add $2 billion to the pot. Visa's pledge is meant to help bring people into the formal banking system, while GAPS will help increase materials sourced from the region. This investment is on track to generate, as a result of what we have done so far, tens of thousands of jobs, investments in sectors such as agriculture and textiles. This investment also means that more than 10 million people will have access to banking services and credit. The pledges are a key part of the Biden administration's plan to address root causes of migration from Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador, a region known as the Northern Triangle. Curbing irregular migration is currently a top priority for President Joe Biden as record numbers of people try to enter the United States at the Mexican border. Biden is set to formally kick off the Summit of the Americas on Wednesday. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, health workers demonstrated in cities across France to demand high pay and more staff services stretched to breaking point just days before the country votes in parliamentary elections. Gathered in front of A&E, these doctors and nurses in Grenoble say they're here to denounce a different type of healthcare emergency. They say French hospitals are in crisis, nowhere more so than in urgent care. They're calling for an end to bed closures. In Bordeaux, healthcare workers were also out protesting. Dozens of other protests were held across the country. Some 120 departments are either preparing or already have had to cut back services due to a shortage of healthcare workers. In Rouen, healthcare workers say they're striking just to have the equipment they need to do their jobs. Last week, French President Emmanuel Macron launched an urgent inquiry which is set to identify practical solutions to the hospital crisis by the end of the month. A key federal advisory committee voted to recommend emergency authorization for a new COVID-19 vaccine developed by the Maryland biotechnology company Novavax, making it the fourth inoculation against the disease. Advisors to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration on Tuesday voted overwhelmingly to recommend that the agency authorize Novavax's COVID-19 vaccine for adults, which the drug maker hopes can become the shot of choice among some American vaccine skeptics. The panel of outside vaccine experts voted 21 to 0 with one abstention in favor of the vaccine for those 18 and older. Because Novavax's shot is more traditional, employing technology that has been used for decades to combat diseases including hepatitis B and influenza, the Maryland-based company is hoping to gain a foothold within the roughly 27 million U.S. adults who are yet to be vaccinated, particularly those who do not want to receive a vaccine based on groundbreaking mRNA technology, like the COVID-19 jabs on offer from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. FDA officials agreed that having a protein-based shot like the one developed by Novavax may help drive more vaccine acceptance among the hesitant. FDA official Peter Marks told the panel Tuesday, quote, anything we can do to get more people comfortable to be able to accept these potentially life-saving medical products is something that we feel we are compelled to do. But demand has not materialized in Europe since the Nova vaccine was approved last year. Around 12.6 million doses of Novavax's vaccine have been distributed in the European Union, but only around 220,000 doses of the two-shot inoculation have been administered there since it was launched in December. If the FDA follows the recommendation and authorizes the shot, it will be the fourth COVID vaccine available for use in adults in the United States. Struggling to find a charger may soon be a thing of the past for millions of European phone users as the EU agreed to implement a uniform charging port for mobile phones, tablets and cameras. It's the world's first move which Brussels say would make life easier for consumers and save their money. Europeans will soon be able to forget about packing a jumble of different chargers for their gadgets. 
The EU on Tuesday agreed rules that will require a standard charging port for phones, tablets and other devices. It's a world-first move, which Brussels says will save consumers around $267 million per year. Euro MP Alex Saliba set out the change. Um, so today we have made the common charger a reality in Europe. European consumers were frustrated with multiple chargers piling up within their homes. Now they will be able to use a single charger for all portable electronics, which is an important step to increase consumer convenience. The move follows complaints from iPhone and Android users about having to use different chargers. Most Android phones use some type of USB port, while Apple favours lightning cables. Now the US tech giant won't be pleased by the EU ruling. It has long argued that such a move will stifle innovation. But Internal Market Commissioner Thierry Breton says there are big benefits, which go beyond consumer convenience. But, uh, uh, this new rules will, uh, will save more than 1,000 tonnes of electronic waste per year, would you imagine, just for one regulation? Yeah, uh, and also in addition to an annual reduction of almost 200 kilos of CO2, which is an equivalent of 10 million smartphones, and 2,600 tonnes of raw materials. By the autumn of 2024, USB-C connectors will be the standard. Since the rules will also cover cameras, e-readers and other gadgets, they will also affect makers like Samsung and Huawei, not just Apple. The EU will also have the power to harmonise wireless chargers, which are fast catching on in popularity. Amid escalating tensions on the Korean peninsula, the U.S. Special Envoy for North Korea has again given a clear warning that North Korea could conduct a nuclear test at any time. Special U.S. Representative for North Korea, Sang Kim, warned that Pyongyang seems to have completed preparations for what will be its seventh nuclear test. Speaking during a telephone briefing on Tuesday, Kim also noted there is not a clear timetable for the possible test. He reiterated what other U.S. officials have already said, acknowledging that the regime had completed preparations at its nuclear test site in Punggiri. Kim highlighted that Washington hopes that the regime will refrain from conducting such a provocation, which could lead to serious uncertainties in the region. The U.S. envoy also emphasized that his country maintains close coordination with its allies and partners to respond to any provocation from North Korea in a swift and strong manner. Kim nevertheless had already stressed that the U.S. is open to a more comprehensive and flexible approach towards the North if it intends to find a diplomatic resolution to solve its nuclear issue. He explained how Washington had continued to reach out to the North for talks over the past year, adding that there was no response from the regime. Tensions on the Korean Peninsula had been escalating, with Pyongyang exhibiting signs of a possible nuclear test on top of the 18 missile tests conducted so far since the beginning of this year. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Monkeypox, which is now spreading to more and more non-endemic countries, has been legally designated as a Tier 2 infectious disease in South Korea. Local authorities in South China's Guangdong and Guangxi have stepped up emergency responses efforts, including issuing water traffic control measures and evacuating affected residents after torrential rains drenched large parts of two regions. NASA plans to launch rockets from northern Australia to scientific research within weeks. This marks the first time NASA has launched rockets from a commercial facility outside the United States. Villagers in southern Thailand help release a stranded dugong back into the ocean after a beach itself. The stranded dugong, which is an endangered mammal also known as a sea cow. Following an attack on a Catholic church in southwest Nigeria, the number of churchgoers killed has been updated to 38 people, including women and children. This comes as local authorities announced that five unidentified attackers carried three detonated explosives, shot worshippers outside and inside St. Francis Catholic Church.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with Canada honoring the Queen by shining purple lights onto Niagara Falls and lighting a beacon in Ottawa. Stay safe and have a good night.